Welcome to We're All in This Together. I'm Betty Keller from St. John's Prairie, Vermont, and we'll be talking about um, how interested the rest of the country is in what Vermont is doing in healthcare right now. I'm very pleased today to have two guests with me, the doctors Farley. I have with me uh, Joshua Farley, who is a professor at, U at the University of Vermont. And um, why don't you tell the audience a little bit, of, you're an economics professor, but you're, I'll let you follow. All right. So I'm a professor of ecological economics at the University of Vermont. And ecological economics, we basically believe that the economic system is a subset of the global ecosystem, and we have to pay attention to economic sustainability and just distribution and use the resources we have wisely. And healthcare is actually absolutely one of the most critical resources that any economist should be thinking about. We're very interested in those resources that are essential and have no substitutes, and uh, that brings healthcare front and foremost. Thank you very much. And then I also have with me his father, uh, Dr. Eugene Farley, Hi. who is a clinician and has a very um, wide and long background in medicine and has historically also um, been in Vermont for a year during his training. And uh, thank you very much for being here today. I'm glad to be here, Betty. So Dr. Farley is visiting his son, Dr. Um, Dr. Jean Farley, <laughs> <laughs> is, um, is currently living in Wisconsin, where he is a professor emeritus at the University of Wisconsin. And I will let you explain a little bit more about your background. OK. Well, uh, I used to be a real family doctor. Uh, this year, I'm giving up my license at 84. I figure I don't need it anymore. Uh, and so, because I'm so busy on the political end, we've got to get universal health care. It's an idiot concept that America has the most expensive, crazy system in the world. What's my background? Uh, I grew up knowing I wanted to be a rural practitioner uh, and knowing, growing up during the Depression, knew everybody had to have health care coverage. And obviously in America, that's not considered democratic, well, or not considered proper anyway. And uh, so for I graduated from med school in 1954, and all those years since, I've been working for universal health care. And my wife was, uh, I met in med school, she was working for it. And when we retired, we became going all over the state speaking for the single payer type system using Canadian Medicare as a model that we could emulate or at least learned a tremendous amount from. And I'm very pleased that Vermont is making some steps that may get us there. Uh, and even in our federal government with Obamacare's, which some people call the Obamacare, but it's Obamacare's <laughs> uh, uh, Affordable Care Act, which is far from where we need to go, but it is a building permit that lets us recognize that our, we, the people through our federal government, have said, yes, maybe we have some responsibility for the health care of everybody. So it's a, uh, putting the toe in the water to find out whether it's right. So I call it a building permit, and now we have to build on that. The blueprint is not adequate, but I will go with it and keep improving it until we get to universal health care. Thank you so, so much. So that doesn't give you much background, but it's my <laughs> politics. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with the audience just a little bit about your background, that as soon as you went into medicine, you already knew you thought that everyone should get health care. Can you talk a little bit about your faith history? Sure. OK. Well, I, I grew up in a Quaker family. Uh, and obviously, uh, that is, well, uh, theoretically, the basis is, is that of good or the old-fashioned way, that of God in everybody. And our job is to find that of good in ourselves and that of good in everybody else. And, uh, and that's a tradition I grew up in. And uh, so that everybody has worth, everybody is important, and we have to identify that in ourselves and help in, in others. And uh, Obviously, service to others is an important part because we are all part of a community. And I could not have a son who's preaching ecological economics and not uh, be convinced that healthcare is a part of ecological justice. Mm -hmm. And that term I got from him. Because <laughs> ecology deals with a wider community, the broad community, whether it's the community of us human beings, but us human beings in the context of the community, the whole planet, mm -hmm. and all its diversity and its interrelationships. We all need every part of it, and uh, healthcare is a part of that. Thank you, thank you. And so, you being raised in that household, do you have anything to add about your faith or values impacting your choices? Uh, I would have say it's very interesting that uh, I would never have guessed when I was younger. My dad knew he wanted to go on and be a doctor. If you'd asked what I was least likely to become, I would have said an economist, I think. <laughs> and I uh, went on to become an ecological economist. And one of the first things they teach you in an economics program is that people are perfectly rational and perfectly self-interested. We do not care about others. 
And right away, coming from the family I did, that was absolutely impossible assumption for me to accept and kind of laid the groundwork for me to reject much of what I learned in the neoclassical economics because it was built on, I thought, uh, many similarly ridiculous assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say as though uh, I don't really consider myself a Quaker. I think I have strong Quaker values and, uh, and it seemed to me that it was an obligation of members of a society to help other members of that society and, uh, and we're now a global society. So it, it always seemed to me that that's the way we had to think about things. Thank you. Thank you. So in the past um, two years, Vermont has made some major strides toward trying to develop a system where everyone gets the health care they need when they need it in a setting that's appropriate and um, maintain the quality or improve the quality of care to have get better outcomes and um, to lower the costs all at the same time. And so um, in the past year, we passed Act 48, and um, this is the path that we've drawn out to try to see how to get to a universal health care system for the state of Vermont. And in, in, the, you know, in the news, in, when you go to forums and people raise concerns, one of the questions is, are we going too fast? And I'm wondering if you could speak to that first and then the father. Yeah, certainly. I think, um, I think it's pretty clear we're not going fast enough in this country. That our country, we pay a, spend a higher percent of our GNP than any other country on the planet on health care. We have one of the highest GNPs, or GDP is a more common phrase these days. We have one of, one of the highest GDPs to begin with. And on virtually every measure of health care, we come out behind all the other developed nations. And to me, we can't afford to spend so much um, essentially to, to provide an inferior quality. We can't afford not to have some kind of single payer system. If we're in an epic of an era of fiscal crises, of deficits, more important than ever now that we move towards a less expensive uh, system that has more complete coverage. And this notion that the private sector insurance can provide our health care needs is simply perverse. As an economist, the only way you could develop a private sector system that had the correct incentives to provide health care was that you only pay them when you're healthy. You cease to pay the health care system when you're sick, so their task would be to keep you healthy. Because the and product is that you want health. The product is right. you want health. That's what you're paying for. And, um, and you know, if you're paying only when you're sick, well, if fortunately people aren't so rational and self-interested, uh, as economists claim, but then it would be in the self-interest of the doctors to make us get sick more often. Um, it would be the self-interest of the companies to make sure that, of the, of the medical sector, to make sure there are contagious diseases that will continually infect us, to make sure there are uh, pollution, um, uh, pollutants and other um, environmental impacts that will keep us ill and keep them in business and keep the GMP growing because mm -hmm. the sicker we get, the better it is for our economy mm -hmm. um, under the current system. Right. And, and I'll, I'll say this, we have the most idiotic system in the whole Western world. We pay twice as much to keep over 50 million people without insurance. And that's a very expensive thing to keep those people without it. And any rational businessman, and when business says well, we can't afford it, they're idiots. We're already paying for it, paying twice as much as any other nation to get less good outcomes. Mm -hmm. So if a businessman says we can't afford it, we're paying for it already. We are paying for uh, it already. Out of, whether we pay it in taxes or out of our pockets, we're paying more than any other nation, mm -hmm. every individual and yet we say we can't afford it. Well, we're paying for a terrible system. Right. With good, we have good capabilities. I mean, we have fantastic resources, fantastic doctors, fantastic educational system for healthcare, fantastic <coughs> medical schools, research, everything else. But we are the most anti-business, the anti-unfriendly business system I've ever seen. So when a businessman says, we can't afford it. I say, you're no businessman. You don't know well, beans about beeswax. Mm -hmm. I get very angry mm -hmm. because they're talking anti-business. Mm -hmm. Those who want a single, and I'll use Canadian uh, Medicare single payer as a prototype. It is better to do business in Canada because everybody's covered. You can start your own business. You can imagine what it would do to Vermont if 100% of you were already covered. You could hire, you could start new businesses. You wouldn't have to worry about how I can afford health care coverage. So, Businesses that say they, we can't support it, all they are for is for insurance company profit on Wall Street because we're the only nation that says mm -hmm. uh, we want our health care to be uh, financed and run by a system that is maximizes Wall Street investor profit 
and minimizes good care for the population. Mm -hmm. So if I'm healthy, they want to insure me. If I'm unhealthy, heck, why do we have Medicare? Because us old geezers cost more. And so that they, they didn't want us. Now that they think that, Medica that the government may pay them for my, uh, they want uh, the government to pay a private insurance company to take that money for investor profit on Wall Street so that I have to pay more for health care. Most anti-business, stupid concepts I've ever read in my life. <laughs> I'm emphatic, as you can see. I, can see. I have one clarification I want to make. People often hear, oh, America spends twice as much as any of the other industrialized countries. But I, my understanding, and maybe one of you should correct me if I'm wrong, but is that when you look at all the different prices, we cost considerably more than anybody else. And we cost more than, more than twice as much of the average of all the rest. But there are some that are like cost more than half as much of us as us, but not as much as us. Right. So, okay, so it's not that we cost more than twice as much as any right. other country, but we right. cost more than twice as much as the average for mm. all the industrialized right. countries, not comparing ourselves to impoverished nations, but comparing us to our other civilized, developed nations right. that mm. we would like to be compared to. Right. And it's interesting, actually, that if you look at the OE, the, um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development are the European countries, plus a few others, South Korea, Japan, um, and their average expenditure is 9% of GNP, uh, or no, a little bit less than 9% of GNP. Um, I think it's actually 9% less than ours. I think it's 8% of GNP. We're 17% of GNP. The difference would, if, um, would more than pay off our entire federal deficit. Mm. So if we somehow could channel the extra resources we spend on health care to paying off the deficit, we'd be running a surplus. Mm. Mm -hmm. and and I'm, I'm going to jump here. It's really taking your question a different way. Mm -hmm. But um, they, they say, you know, I don't want to pay for somebody's health care who doesn't leave a decent life. Yet the most radical right-wing conservative I know of, and I have some <laughs> friends and family members, not sons or children, <laughs> uh, <laughs> who are that way, and they don't want to pay a cent for somebody else's health care who doesn't live a proper life, mm -hmm. uh, who smokes or drinks or doesn't take care. And yet, in reality... If I were a dead-end alcoholic, smoker, chronic lung disease, and everything else, and I got hit out by a car out here, the most radical right-wing conservative would say, get Gene to the hospital. They wouldn't say, leave him there, let him get in the way of traffic. They'd say, get him to a hospital. And who's going to pay for that hospital? Well, they don't want to because I'm a dead-end alcoholic, no good drunk. And, but they do because they refuse to pay the services that would maybe help me not be that. I could still be that and uh, be in good care, but still be that. Mm -hmm. But at least they are going to pay for it, whether they're radical right-wing conservatives or liberals. Mm -hmm. They're going to pay for the care that I get as a dead-end alcoholic drunk. By the way, I hope I'm not a dead-end <laughs> alcoholic drunk. But <laughs> and if I could just add, as an economist, since we have decided as a nation that we are not going to leave people simply to die in the street, that if you show up at the hospital, you will get care. It's, le it's law. We have to do that. So the question is, since we've decided on the moral issue, now the challenge is, what's the most cost-effective way to do that? Is it best to wait till people have emergency, uh, serious emergencies and are rushed to the emergency room at extremely high cost, or is it better to pay ahead of time for that preventative care? What's more cost-effective? Because we're not going to leave them to die on the street. Right. And so what happens right now is if the person who has no health care coverage, if they get ill or get hit by a car or whatever, and they get their care in the hospital under those extreme circumstances, we pay for it because the hospital has to shift those costs somewhere else. So, and they can't shift onto Medicare or Medicaid. So typically it's up shifted onto um, the premiums of the private insurance. And so I, as a doctor, they say, should see them free. So I need to settle where I make sure everybody's rich and healthy. <laughs> so, so we have uh, underserved areas. Yeah, so we have, because, and it. when Linda and I entered rural practice, uh, it was hard to get people into rural practice. Uh, we didn't have Medicare. And I had a lot of elderly, mostly widows, who were living in single rooms in a uh, house in a small town with a uh, rent a room. And the $4 office calls, they often couldn't visit, afford. And we wouldn't charge anything. But once we got Medicare, they came in with pride because they didn't think they were asking for charity. I, Linda and I never felt we were giving charity. We were giving care to people who needed it and didn't charge them if they, didn't, if they couldn't afford it. And uh, we didn't investigate whether they could afford it. We knew because we're a small rural town. Right. And uh, once Medicare came in, these responsible people who didn't want to incur debt, who didn't want to uh, get cumbered up with all kinds of things, they wouldn't even go to emergency rooms because they'd be done. And uh, so responsible people delay care. And they're considered irresponsible 
So what's the choice? If I'm going to be done because I can't pay, uh, so I'm embarrassed, so I won't go, and so I'm done because I didn't go. Mm -hmm. I'm blamed either way, when in reality, health care is a necessity. I'm a, I'm a conceited doctor, I think, and you're a doctor too. We know that we do some good. We may not do all the good we'd like to do, mm -hmm. but it's important, health care, availability to it. And so back to the um, earlier question, are we going too fast? Your son gave his story, and from what you're saying, I'm sa hearing you say, no, we're not going too fast, but can you just give a little bit of the history? Sure. Uh, 106 years ago, maybe it's 105 years ago, anyway, I think it was 1906, Teddy, bill, uh, Teddy Roosevelt introduced a bill, uh, a proposal for universal health care. Mm -hmm. So we've had over 106 years in the United States to say, no, we shouldn't have universal health care. In the process, all the other nations have. Originally, when it came up, it was going to be more like Germans the, under Bismarck. Bismarck had established it. And of course, we got to war with Germany after that, and so it stopped going through because it was un-American to have something like Germany had. Mm -hmm. And of course, Germany still has an excellent uh, coverage system. It's different than the single payer, but it's, it does the job. They have insurance companies that and are strictly universal. controlled, Everybody and it's universal, it. strictly controlled, not for investor profit insurance companies or so that they, people can say, well, they have insurance companies. Well, yes, if you put the restraints on our insurance companies that they could make no investor profit, they had to meet certain standards and supply this and that, our insurance companies would get out of the business of healthcare because they're in there for investor profit. If they don't look good on Wall Street, they close. Mm -hmm. So they have to look good. But I don't want them to look good on Wall Street because they deny people healthcare who need it. And the best way to maximize your profits, I think it's about 1% of Americans account for 27% of health care costs. The top 10% of Americans, or the, the least well 10% of Americans, count for a huge percentage of costs. And if you want to maximize profits, the way to do that is to ensure that, above, at all, by all means, you do not insure any of those people. So these companies actually spend a huge amount of money making sure they deny care to certain groups. Those, those groups, of course, then fall under the government, under Medicare or Medicaid, uh, to be taken care of, which means that our government sector takes care of the least healthy, the most expensive, while the the, um, the insurance companies get to walk away with the profits by taking care of the healthiest, and that's the profit maximization model. Can you talk briefly, you say they spend a lot of money to make sure they don't cover those people. Now, some yeah. of those people just by getting older will be on Medicare, and some yeah. of those people who are poor will be on that. Yeah. But then the other people they still don't want to treat, the ones who are middle class, and younger than 65, they still want to treat. So what do they do to avoid that? So the private insurance companies, if you have any kind of existing condition, and I have a, a niece and a nephew who have exist, pre-existing conditions. And they're um, young. They're young, and, uh, and they're actually pretty healthy, but because one has allergies and one has cerebral palsy, it has been, it's extremely difficult for them to get insurance. One brother has had to have catastrophic insurance, so he pays very high premiums and only gets care if uh, the costs are really high. And the other brother, very creative, entrepreneurial kind of guy, had to work for corporations so that he could have health care coverage. Now that his son is on, um, is a fully funded in a entrepreneurship, very special entrepreneurship program at the University of Houston, full scholarship, my brother now has the freedom to start a job. And he start, start his own, start, start a job, I'm sorry, start a business. And he started a business in the kind of the worst economic slump. He's hiring 10 people with full health care coverage. He's really making an impact on our dismal economy. And he was not free to do that when he had to worry about getting health insurance for his son that the, um, the insurance companies would never have provided. Mm -hmm. And the biggest threat to starting a business, and I, I used my oldest son that he mentioned, who had pre-existing conditions, his wife has pre-existing conditions, he's in his 50s, and insurance companies, if they can't make a profit, don't want them. Right. So the most expensive thing for him as he started his own business, and the least secure is, how do I make sure everybody has health care coverage? Because he's like I am, he believes everybody has to have it. He obviously is for a single payer type, um, but since America is anti-business in its works, <laughs> uh, uh, he has to worry how he can do it. Well, he's done it and it has taken a huge amount of manipulation. Our third son, his brother, who uh, is a small-time carpenter builder and uh, in Colorado, and he pays a huge amount for inadequate health care. He's considered high risk because he's in construction, and he has to pay a huge amount for inadequate health care coverage. As he says, he's one sickness or one accident away from bankruptcy because mm -hmm. the co-pays and deductibles are so high that he'd have to be during this decline in, in the economy, he'd have to have so, many, so much business growth 
to be able to handle those costs. Mm -hmm. As it is, you know, he, he's doing okay, but piecemeal. Yeah. And, uh, but healthcare is a drag mm -hmm. against business. And that's mm -hmm. why I get so angry when business say they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Business better get on board for a universal system. Otherwise, they're totally anti-business. And small businesses are absolutely damaged by not being able to start up because they can't afford health care coverage. Mm -hmm. And even, even hiring or doing things when somebody doesn't have health care coverage, it's hard. It's a very hard. Um, I want to know whether you'd be um, like uh, whether you would like to speak on the issue of whether this legislation was rammed down our throats here in Vermont. Um, I think it's really ironic that people would refer to a legislation that uh, everything suggests it will lower our costs, increase coverage, improve our quality of life in Vermont. And they say, well, how do you ram something like that down our throats? How do you ram cost savings down somebody's throats? How do you ram improved quality down somebody's throats? I think it's very clear, it's, it's what, what's been rammed down our throats is this message from the insurance companies that, uh, that they spend billions of dollars on to tell us that if we go to some kind of European system or single payer system, we'll be waiting in lines and not have our choice of doctors. And I think the irony, this summer, for example, I had a, a bike accident and I broke my arm pretty badly and dislocated my wrist. And I go to the emergency room and they put me in a cast. So I have a splint on for nine days, my bone ends grating on each other. I have to wait nine days to get surgical treatment. I do not get my choice of doctor. I had a friend in Croatia who had a very similar accident at the same time. He was upset he had to wait two days and then got superb coverage. So the irony of this though is that the additional profits my insurer, and I have good insurance by US standards, the additional profits my insurer makes by delaying my care and giving me inadequate care goes to fund their advertisement saying that if we move to a European system, you know, we, will, uh, we won't have our choice of uh, providers. And I looked it up and uh, um, Croatia actually spends one quarter of what we do on health care. One quarter per capita. One quarter per capita. Mm -hmm. And that's in a purchasing power parity. That means the dollars are adjusted for what else you can buy in your economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so in that case, you had to wait because your insurance had a list of providers you had to choose from. So you don't have provider choice. And I don't have provider choice. And the other thing is I'm not qualified to choose. I mean, the fact is I had, uh, you know, some kind of fracture I don't know much about. I can't exactly walk from doctor to doctor with my bone broken in half and my wrist dislocated and all the muscles ripped off the bone and saying, um, I'd like your opinion on this. You know, could I have, could, you know, um, and what do I know about the quality of a doctor? And you can't really find that information. It's simply for markets to work, you need to have good information. And we simply don't have good information about medical care unless we have a PhD or an MD. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you have to have an MD in that particular field to be really qualified. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't have time while waiting for care to get that MD, to mm -hmm. be a judge of who was the best doctor. So you just gave an example of um, not having your choice of provider, of having a long waiting time, nine days for a broken bone, with the ends of the bone rubbing against yeah. each other, and about healthcare being ra rationed. So, so those are three of the big things we hear about being problems with universal care, and all three of those things would be better if you were in a system with universal coverage with adequate planning for where the health care should be provided. And the irony about rationing health care, people say if we're in a universal system, we'll have to ration health care. If anybody who's ever taken a course in economics, studied free market economics, they know the price mechanism, putting prices on things, is referred to price rationing. We ration things to whoever is willing and able to pay. So we ration things, you have to have a demand for something, plus you have to have the purchasing power behind that demand. So if I'm destitute and I break my arm, I have no market demand because I simply cannot put any purchasing power behind my demand for a broken arm. So a wealthy person's demand for having a splinter mood expressed in monetary terms is far higher than a destitute person's demand for life-saving surgery. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a, you know, the irony, when they say that other systems will lead to rationing, markets are all about price rationing. That is what they do, and that's what they can do very well for some resources. Mm -hmm. Healthcare is one of those things that they don't do it very well for, for a variety I, of reasons. I'd like to add a little bit, I'm sidetracking a bit, but you know, you see, hear the propaganda about the Canadian system, long waiting lines, long this and that. If I need a, uh, elective gallbladder surgery, it may take longer in Canada. Uh, if I need, let's say, if I need an urgent coronary bypass and they're not equipped to do it, they send me down to the States to get it and they pay for it. And they even pay for my family coming. So that yes, we're, we're 300 million, they're 30 million. 
They're stretched out along border. We have a lot of our resources up there. So they're good businessmen. They say, okay, we can't develop that right here, so let's send them to the U.S., which has an oversupply of that. Very rational, not rationing, and they pay for it. So people do come south. But also, uh, I had to go north once to get a surgery repeated that had failed here, and uh, uh, it was done very well here, but it broke down, and the surgeon didn't want to repeat it, so he sent me to Canada to a hospital that was noted for that internationally. Hmm. So that um, we have idiot concepts, then Fraser, the Fraser uh, Institute, which is a radical right-wing heritage foundation type institute in Canada uh, that preaches privatization of everything, so schools, healthcare, the whole work and the whole kit and caboodle. And they send terrible propaganda about buses south, you know, the bus from Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yes, we have more buses going to Canada to get reduced drug prices than we have coming from Canada. And we've done studies along all the border hospitals and can't find these huge numbers of people. I think there were nine found uh, the year there was a study was done with the PNHP and others. And uh, the question is these were down, they were paid for by Canada. Mm -hmm. Now, the Sun people who used to come down to Florida for the winter, Canada originally paid for their health care down here. Now they'll pay for emergency care down here, and then they come back up there for their care because it's so expensive, so expensive especially if you're in Florida. Mm -hmm. And one other bit, even though I'm taking too much time, uh, a friend of ours uh, uh, who her husband used to practice here in the United States, he's practiced in Canada for years, he's now retired. She was coming off the uh, airport uh, in uh, Vancouver, fell and broke her hip. Within four hours, she was operated on. And there was no question as to whether she, what her insurance was. She was covered. Mm -hmm. And uh, excellent care, rehabilitation already taken care of. Um, and kidney transplants taken care of. You know, uh, blood marrow uh, uh, transplants, which uh, when uh, I'm going blank on his name, was running for president who had had bone marrow transplants. And uh, he said he could never have been alive if he had been Canadian. That's where the head, the biggest research was done on it, was most done, and it was covered. You didn't have a bake sale. Mm -hmm. Our insurance companies say it's an experimental, so we can't pay for it. Mm -hmm. So the lies that we learn about other systems, because we're protecting a model that is irrational uh, for investor profit insurance, the media man who says, I don't want to cover people who need care. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much. Um, we will be having another opportunity to speak with um, Joshua Farley about why the market system can't work to improve quality and reduce costs in healthcare, and um, and give very clear explanations that you know, especially business people will understand. But we'll do it so that everybody will understand why it can't actually work. I'm trying to put a round peg into a square hole or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad you were able to join us today, um, coming from Wisconsin, uh -huh. giving us a perspective, a historical, long-term perspective from your many years advocating for health care and serving as a family physician in, um, in a rural area. So you have an experience similar to ours here. Thank you so know, much for joining us. I hope people have seen what's been happening in Wisconsin uh, since we have been going under uh, structural readjustment of the whole system with the election, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I hope you've seen the crowds come out in the Capitol Square. It's exciting. Just hopefully we can minimize the bad effects of structural readjustment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and I hope to have you join us again as we continue to look at how Act 48 impacts, um, impacts health care in Vermont and, and how the planning under that system will go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.